across this place. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. He is worthy. Sing Jesus. church we're so glad that you're here with us this morning and you know we have one more song that we're going to sing together and there's a line in this song that says where the cross stands tall there is unity and what i love about singing a line like that is that even in the world that we're in today that can be so divisive there's so many opposite opinions so many things that make us different from each other but the one thing that unites us is the fact that jesus died on the cross for all of us it wasn't just one person, but it was all of humanity, right? That's, that's something we can celebrate today. So as we, we begin to worship together, 
I just wanna encourage you. If you may be feeling hopeless from what you're seeing around you, just be, just be hopeful today knowing that what Jesus has done for us brings us together. It's something that we can stand together on as we put our hope in him. We thank you, Jesus.
blessings by his precious blood, we've been set free. Who's thankful for that truth this morning? Come on, we're gonna claim that in victory. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for your blood, Lord. Come on, let's sing this in faith and claim that this morning. Sing by his precious blood. By his precious blood, we have been set free. There's no stranger here at the same. Yeah, lift it up. And where the cross stands tall, there is you. precious blood by his precious blood we have been set free and there's no stranger here at the same and where the cross stands tall there is you and all are welcome tall sons and daughters sing by his precious blood we have last week of our series on Philippians. So we have been in uh, a study on the book of Philippians for now six weeks. This is our sixth and final week. And remember, this has been um, you know, a study on soul health. That's kind of the tagline for the series is Paul wrote, Paul's an early church leader, wrote this letter to the church in Philippi uh, as an encouragement of how to be aligned with God, how to be unified, how to have a healthy soul, especially in the midst of of difficult circumstances. So um, I just want to really quick recap week one as we jump into week six here. So in the first week, we talked about how we have a tendency to overemphasize what's happening to us and not pay enough attention to what's happening inside of us. What's happening inside of us is actually way more important than what's happening around us because we can't control what happens around us. And so we're gonna jump off of that into our final week. And this week, um, we're gonna be talking about peace in, in terms of what's happening inside of us. This is gonna be a, a great way to just put a bow of this series that we've been in on Philippians. And if you haven't uh, caught some of the messages up to this point, I would just wanna say, do yourself a favor. Carve out some time. If you've missed any of the messages along the way, you can catch them on YouTube. Do yourself a favor for your relationship with God, for the health of your soul. These messages have been so good and so helpful. So if you've missed any, if you wanna rewatch them, I'd encourage you to do that. Today, though, we're talking about peace. Remember what's happening inside of us. And I wanna talk about some things that are maybe enemies to our peace inside of our soul. One of the biggest things that pushes back against peace inside of us is just the natural pressure that happens as you get older. If you, you know, I, I've just found that with each stage of life there, you get a little bit added, you get another plate added to the, the list of things that you're balancing. And it just sort of feels like the pressure of life picks up and picks up and picks up and it doesn't really ever slow down. Um, makes me think of when I was uh, really up until age 10, actually, I hated amusement parks hated them, hated them. I did not ever, I would go with my family 
And, you know, my parents would always try to convince me to go on it, but I, the, the feeling of like the butterflies in your stomach when you spin or when you go down, I just never liked that. And even now, even now, like when I buckle into a ride, there's still a little bit of that like little kid panic in me of like, what am I, what am I getting into? But I remember when I was like four or five, my, my dad, you know, we would go to Kennywood and you know, amusement park in the area. We would go to this, this amusement park and, you know, throughout the day, he'd be trying to coerce me. Come on, like you can do it. You're gonna write, you can get over this. It'd be really good for you to do. And then always by the end of the day, his inner dad would come out and he's like, we've paid good money for these tickets. So, so you're gonna get on that merry-go-round. And, and he forced me to, which was good. It was good for me. But I was like, I'm not doing it. 6 p.m. as the park is like, we're getting ready to leave. I get on that merry-go-round. He's like, 60 seconds. Close your eyes if you have to. But we're, we're, we paid money, so we're getting on this. So I am on this horse, like clinging for my life. But I remember one specific moment when I was, again, probably around the same age, getting old enough now, like tall enough, I can get on some, some rides, but I didn't want to go on them. Uh, to, I have two older siblings. So Dave and Alyssa, and they were riding all of the big kid rides. And, um, you know, again, my parents were really trying to help me. So they were like, look at Dave and Alyssa. They're doing this. You should get on the ride with them. And so eventually they convinced me um, to join them on this ride called the Tilt-A-Whirl. And yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> this is a, a plate that spins and there's pods that seat three people that also rotate as it's going around. And I remember as a kid, I felt like this was like a 40 foot long contraption that was whipping you around at breakneck speeds. And I, was, I hadn't watched a video of this until yesterday. I was watching a video on YouTube and I'm cracking up because it's this dinky little tiny ride. It's not even spinning that fast. But I get on this ride with my brother and sister and I remember, this is a core memory for me. I remember the bar came down and I was hyping myself up. I said out loud, let's do this. And then it takes off and I weep. I start, I break down screaming in tears. And my mom, again, being a great mom, went to the operator and was like, hey, my son is freaking out. Can you stop it? So then 15 seconds into the ride, have to do the walk of shame of my mom comes onto the ride and pulls me off. And everybody's like, what, what the heck is happening? So, okay, this is the sensation of sometimes what the building pressure of life feels like. As you get older and as you just start to juggle more, and it can even start even when you're younger, the, the pressure of life sometimes just makes you go, okay, all right, I'm done. Can I get off, please? I've, I've had enough of this. I'm not having fun anymore. And, and I think maybe, maybe it's not even that intense. I think some of us have those moments where we, we, are, we go into a hard season and it's just like, man, when is this gonna let up? I think even sometimes it's less, it doesn't have to be dramatic. I think there's some of us that if we were honest, and if people asked you, how you doing? You'd probably say, I'm busy. You know, yeah, I'm busy, I'm stressed, but, but things are going. But internally, there's this just feeling of like, man, I just, I would just love for this to let up. Like, I, I, you know, the feeling of what it's like to be on vacation where you can just enjoy life. I would love to be able to translate that to some of here. Just that feeling, and it can be different things, right? It's, it's the feeling of school, and you gotta, you gotta make money, and you gotta provide, and you gotta plan for your future, and you got retirement and investments and health, and it's just everything. It feels like it never stops, never slows down. And then on top of that, life does not usually wait for convenient moments to throw gut punches. You know, like life doesn't wait until, it doesn't ask you for permission for a good time for tragedy to strike. So it's pressure, 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 nonstop. You're dealing with it. You get used to it and the anxiety and the depression and you just kind of deal with that. This is just kind of how the pressure is and you kind of avoid that. And then you get struck with loss and grief and failure and hardship. And then it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. There's nothing that makes it stop. And you're just sometimes like, oh my gosh, I would just love for this to slow down a little bit. And I think we probably have all been in that place at points. And I, I wanna say really quick before we study Philippians and kind of address this, those feelings are definitely normal, right? We can't avoid anxiety and depression and anger completely. But what we tend to do is we accept the pressure of just what it's like to grow up on this tilt the world of it goes and goes and goes. And sometimes we ignore that these feelings are actually signals that we should be paying attention to. So really, anxiety and fear, worry, depression, and anger, right, they're all opposite to peace. They're pointing to the fact that there is something inside of us. Again, when hardship strikes, 
we're gonna go through hard times. It's not saying that, but, but a lot of times the on the consistency of, of those feelings is like a check engine light that sometimes we even react to other people out of other things. So maybe even this morning, as you were rolling into church, you reacted to a, a spouse or to a parent or to your child or to a friend out of something that's going on in here, out of a, a little check engine light of concern or anxiety about something else. I have three kids, so I know that getting up in the morning and getting them to church is a struggle all on its own, trust me. But, but there's sometimes those, those feelings that we react to somebody else and we just push them aside. But really, there, there are these check engine lights to say something internally is not aligned right. So before we look at this, there's a quick quote from a great pastor. His name's Neil Anderson. And um, we base a lot of our, uh, we do something called Breakthrough Weekend here based a lot of our material on his teaching. But this is a little excerpt from that. Let me just read you what he says about these check engine lights here. Anxiety is a signal of an uncertain goal. So this is a, something we want that we are unsure about and so we're worried about. Depression is a signal of an impossible goal, something we've given up hope on. Anger is a signal of a blocked goal, something or somebody stands in our way. Um, or, and then the final one, this is what we'll look at here, peace is a signal that our goals are aligned with God's. Okay, so we're talking about check engine lights. These are signs of stuff that comes up inside of us that are warnings. Again, it might not even be, you might not even feel like you're on the brink of falling apart, but there's just, boop, little light comes on. You might even be able to go a little bit longer, but at some point, you gotta pay attention to what's going on. And, and what I wanna talk about here is not just peace that lasts for a couple of days or to get you through something hard, but the sort of consistent peace that we've been talking about that, that carries you through life. And so the main thought of today, if, I, if you tuned out on me, just tune back because this is really important right here. It's a very simple main point, but you can go and throw it up. Daily peace stems from godly habits. Okay, very simple main thought, but it's gonna guide everything here. If we want the sort of peace that will carry us through every single day and every situation. It comes from setting up some godly rhythms and foundations in our life. Because, listen, God is a God of overwhelming peace. He is a God of hope. He's a God who sees what you are going through now in this moment. And so if you feel lost or alone or unseen, listen, this could be God reaching out to you today to say, here's a little rope for you. It's not, a, it's not a magic deal or no deal button. You say, I take the deal, Howie, and everything's fixed. But God is a God of peace that when we choose to align ourselves with him, we are guaranteed peace. And so what we're gonna look at some, some different habits and choices that we can make based on the last chapter in Philippians that will align us with God to bring us closer to him and to bring us that peace. So, we're gonna start in Philippians chapter four, verse six here. So if you wanna follow along in your Bibles or on your devices, it'll also be on the screen here. Um, but here is Philippians chapter four, verse six. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is, the real, this is a real popular verse you may have heard before. And so, again, we're talking now about if daily peace stems from setting up godly habits in our life. If living different than everyone else and living from that transformative peace comes from setting up godly habits. Okay, what's the first one we can pull here? First one is, number one, what you do with your concerns. So the first habit that is critical to set up as when the check engine light comes on, what is the habit is, what, we, what are we doing with our concerns? So let me just ask you now, pause for a minute and just kind of check internally. What are the things that you are really concerned about? Some of you can rattle them off instantly without even thinking about it. And there's some of us that may have, may have to dig a little bit. But what are the things, is it a, a way that somebody else sees you? Is it how work's going, school or friends? Is it health? What is it that you're like, these things are concerned and are maybe directing how I'm acting in general because they're on my list, right? Okay, so now if we look uh, at verse six again, you can throw that up actually for me. Uh, verse six, do not be anxious about anything, um, but in everything through prayer and pleading. Okay, so this verse 
when you see that too, like, okay, if we're talking about the habit of what you do with your concerns, and this is one of the habits we're pulling out of this, there's almost a little bit of like an internal eye roll when you see do not be anxious. Because it feels like it's just an easy answer to what you're going, like do not be anxious. Like it's, I, I sort of am like, oh, do not be anxious. Oh, okay, see, I thought maybe I was being anxious, but that was my, next time I just won't be anxious and we'll be good, right? Like it's like, well, obviously, if I could just not be anxious, do you think I'm trying that? Don't be anxious. Okay, all I need to do, or maybe you felt like, okay, yeah, I've prayed before. Trust me, like, yeah, I've prayed some prayers, but that doesn't fix the fact that I'm anxious. But, but here's what's, what's critical about understanding this habit. So it says, don't be anxious, but instead present your concerns, your prayers with thanksgiving to God. And then go to verse seven here. Verse seven says, and the peace of God, not which answers every request, not which makes everything go the way you want, but what does it say? It surpasses what makes sense to us. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. So when we take time to present our concerns to God, sometimes we're like, I present this and then I hope that this will be taken care of and it's a focus on the external. But actually, the beautiful thing about what Paul is saying here is there is a promise attached to when you present your, your concerns and, and the, your anxieties, your fears, your worries to God. There is a supernatural level of peace when you make a habit out of that that will guard you because we all have either personally experienced this or seen somebody else who things were absolute chaos in the world around them and they were at peace and they acted peacefully towards others. We've also seen, and probably you've experienced this, maybe you're here in this very moment where things aren't that bad around you, but you're an absolute mess. And little things just seem to set you off in anger or fear or anxiety because it doesn't really matter what the external circumstances are necessarily about what's going on internally. So it, when we take time to do this, it's a realignment with that check engine light. This is, this is a, how we respond, this habit. Daily peace stems from the, 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 the habit of now presenting your concerns to God. It's about aligning yourself when that check engine light comes on. I, can I tell you the, 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 the most common response when something comes on. Actually, some of you have probably been here this morning or last night. This is very easy for me to do too. You land in one of two camps when anxiety or restlessness or fear or concern starts to pop up. Usually land in one of two camps and figure out which one you are. You can elbow somebody and whisper to them which one. I don't think you'll have a hard time figuring out. We run to one of two things to sort of avoid these feelings. One is escapism. So if you're in this camp, when these feelings start to, to well up, you know, you just sort of like, I don't want to deal with that. Not that you never do. You kind of do what you got to do. And then it's like, I don't want to just sit in this. So I am going to run to whatever. Media, your phone, you know, hanging out with friends, taking trips, some sort of addiction, whatever. We, we run away from that feeling and numb ourselves. It doesn't even have to be intense, but as soon as we start to feel like, ah, I don't want to just sit in this, then we run there. The other camp, and if you're, if you're escapism, you know very well where, where you're at with that. If you're, if you're in the other camp, when things start to feel out of control in life, you try to take more control and you are uh, fall into the busyness camp. So I won't make anybody wave at me, but you can very clearly, actually, if like husband, wife, you probably very clearly know. I know me and my wife know very clearly which camp we fall into. You speed up the pace. So you, you know, through workaholism or whatever, you've, your life becomes full of things to do. Got to take care of this person. Got to run and work really hard here. Got to make sure I, I, I'm doing this with my money. My family's, it's just everything. It's always busy. And what we can do is we can fill our lives to the brim that we don't have any space with workaholism too, or with the busyness, we can actually, there's a lot of us that can feel noble about that. That's one of the dangers is that we feel like, well, I have to. Who else is gonna do this? I have to be at this pace, right? But what we can do is fill our lives to the brim that we miss this act of coming before God when the check engine light comes on and running here first and allowing a supernatural higher power piece from God to transform us. One last thing I wanna say about this is, one of the biggest threats and, uh, you know, to, to who we are, to our peace and to our obedience to God is this thing right here. 
I think uh, this is a big generalization, but today, I think potentially this is the biggest threat to our peace. And, and okay, so we, this is a wonderful thing. We can communicate with anyone instantly. We have access to all information. You can be insanely productive at any hour of the day. Think about the difference between that and 100 years ago. You can be checking your email and responding to things and starting businesses at any second. There is, you can entertain yourself for a thousand lifetimes with this thing. It stresses me out actually when in the past month I've had people say, have you caught up on this show yet? And I'm like, ah, more homework. I gotta catch up on all the, right? There's so much you can do. But at the same time, there is always something calling your name. And it's not even always a person. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes you got friends and family and boss and work and people are calling you. But a lot of times it's also, you can just be productive. And I, I just, I'm restless. And I, if I just stay caught up on my email, at two, I woke up, I just got to check it real quick. Or you can entertain yourself. You can fuel an addiction. There's so many different, you can play a game, everything. And it's all right here, always, every second of every day. And again, we're talking about the threat here to your peace is that you can fill your life so much with busyness or with escapism that we avoid the check engine light of coming before God. So the practice I want to talk about, and this will apply to each one of these four things. Again, we're talking about bringing your concerns before God is the practice of what I call a soul inventory. Okay, so, um, you know, one of the things we, we talk about in church is doing your devotional time with God. This is praying and reading the Bible. It's a really good habit to do every day to stay close to God. The soul inventory can be part of your devotional time, but I, I, I think if it only stays limited to that, you miss what, what the power of this should be, which is it's a response to when these feelings well up. I'm still learning to do this now. But one of the most powerful things that I have started to practice in the past year is as soon as those feelings of concern or anxiety or whatever well up, taking a few minutes to get alone where this can't bother you. You put it on do not disturb. You're not gonna get called or texted. I know if you have three, actually I have three kids. If you have any kids, trust me, I get it. Finding any time alone is hard. But this has been critical for me of taking time to say, okay, God, here's where I'm at. I don't know what to do with any of this. These are the things I'm concerned about, but I trust, I trust that you have it all worked out. And so I'm gonna lay it before you. I pray that you would help me with all of this. And I think there's two protests to this. One can be, oh, I just don't have enough time. And I get it. Listen, especially if you got kids, it's busy. It's busy, busy, busy. But the truth is we make time for what is important to us. So I would encourage you, Find time for this. The second protest is, is that this forces us to open some wounds of like you're already running around anxious all day, especially if you suffer from, you know, some sort of clinical battle with anxiety or depression or whatever. The, the idea of opening this up to have to live <laughs> in any of this any longer feels wrong. But the truth is, is that when you come before God and it's not just once, it's a daily rhythm to say, okay, God, here's where I'm at, but I trust you. There is a promise from God that the peace of God will go past what makes sense to you and will guard your heart and mind. Okay, so let's move on to the next one here. Next habit and point that aligns us with God and brings peace is what you do with your thoughts. What you do with your thoughts. And this one's interesting because I don't know about you, thoughts feel very hard to control. Like, you can't really control what you think about all the time. Sometimes things just pop in your head and it feels a little bit like, a, you know, a kid in a grocery store. If you ever tried to take a couple kids to the grocery store, you're like, don't touch that. What are you doing? Get out of there. Stay away from that. Don't do that. Hey, stop screaming. It's just like, I can't control what, what I'm thinking. And maybe you've had this before too, like intrusive thoughts where you're having a conversation with somebody and something pops into your head and you're like, if they knew what I was thinking at this moment, they'd be like, what's wrong with you? You know what I'm saying? Just because you can't control what pops in your head. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example of one, and um, this might expose how weird I am, but at the risk of that, I'm gonna say it anyway. So, you know, in the past, I remember watching my dad preach up here. So my dad is Pastor Jeff, if you don't know. He's the lead pastor here. I remember watching him preach up here, and I thought to myself, I would never do this, to be clear. I just have to give this little caveat here. I would never do this, but I remember thinking, I wonder if like I was preaching someday and I just, in the middle of my sermon, like right now, imagine if I did this, I just put down the mic and I walked over to the drums and I just started drumming. Like how long would people stay in this room until they like left? 
Like, like for, you know, for like, the, and then I was like going a little further. It like popped in my head. And I was like, I don't even want to be thinking about this. But like, then I took it further. You know, like, okay, at first maybe people would clap. Like be like, yeah, okay. I guess this is part of the message, right? But then like t- after 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes, would people still be? I think the rule followers, you'd still be here until 20 minutes because I don't want to miss anything. Maybe he'll explain the power of this eventually, right? But what a weird, strange thought. You, it feels like you can't control what you think all the time. But okay, really what we're talking about here, when we're talking about what you do with your thoughts, let's actually, let's look at what Paul says in verse eight here. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And as for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And this is the promise and the God of peace will be with you. Okay, so what we're not talking about is the things that are out of control. And again, especially if you wrestle with some sort of anxiety, you have trouble controlling those thoughts all the time. Okay, what we are talking about is what I like to call your thought diet. So this is the stuff that you choose to dwell on and allow in your hopes and dreams and fears that you are choosing to focus on. And this is also the input of content that you have throughout the week of what are you watching? What are you listening to? Because I have found that we like to think that we can absorb whatever we want. I can watch whatever I want. I can listen to whatever I want. I can hang out with whoever I want to, and it's not going to affect me. But the truth is, is that every single thing that we absorb makes its way up here and makes its way into here. And so what Paul is saying is, you have to be very careful. Whatever you are choosing to dwell on and allow in, be very careful with this. Make sure you're focusing on the right things. And so, okay, the soul inventory, again, this moment where you, in response to check engine lights, you come before God and you lay your thoughts before God and you say, God, this is maybe where I have been landing and I need you to guide me. Because, you know, on my own, I'm probably gonna make some wrong decisions. So guide what I'm focusing on and what I'm allowing in. That's the second habit. Okay, we're gonna jump to verse 11 to pull out the third one here. Here's what verse 11 says. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with little, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And then uh, let's read verse 13 all together, even online. Join with me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Okay, now that last part we'll talk about in a second is usually the part that is separated from everything else and it misses the context of what he just said. So I wanna look at that in a second, but the point that we can pull out of this, the the habit and the rhythm of how to align with God when we have that check engine light is what you do with your lack. And you can throw that out, that's number three. What you do with your lack or your wants or your desires. Because we are fed constantly every day by corporate America the idea that you are one purchase away from getting everything you need. And it's a constant cycle. We talked about this a few weeks ago too. You, it's just the constant idea that one more life stage, one more thing, one more product, and then we'll finally feel the way we need to. But Paul is like yelling. I feel like I can see him yelling it out. Listen, I know the secret. It's taken me a while, but I finally get it. And if you want to know the secret to no matter what happens in my life, I know it's total dependence on the person of Jesus Christ. Because you can't ever control what happens around you. You have so shockingly little control on your circumstances. We like to think that we do, but in truth, we can't really control how life treats us. But you do have control over your dependence on the person of God. And so he's saying when we move to other places, actually with with that verse, again, I can do all things. Verse 13, we have a lot of times made this into a battle cry of I can can overcome anything. I can win this basketball game. I can get that promotion because I can do all things. And while it's not a bad thing to say, you know, God can make anything happen. Really what Paul is saying here is more about it's an anchor for his soul. 
He's like, I don't care if I have no money or if I have everything. I don't care if my health is bad or if it's great. You know, I would love for it to be great, but I can go through anything because I am anchored to something that is bigger than myself. That is actually a beautiful part of the context that we miss about it's the, the anchored through the wind and the waves to say, no matter what I go through in life, I'm anchored to something bigger. So the soul inventory practice here of making time for this every day is to say, God, I believe you're a provider. So for the things that I need in my life, I trust that I can rest in your arms and you're gonna take care of this. But then also I can do all things when I come before you and I'm quiet, I can go through anything even though this is painful, even the world's in chaos, you can give me peace and contentment. So gratitude is actually the way to combat this, to say, I keep thinking that my hope and my peace is attached to whatever, but really it's found in you. So let's go to the last point here in habit. And that is what you choose to do with your resources. That's number four, what you do with your resources. And I wanna read this last section here in, the verse, in verse 15. He says this, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. So he's talking to the Philippian church here. For even in Thessalonica, you sent me a gift more than once for my needs and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Will you just read uh, that, that last part and my God right there, ready? Read it with me. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So really what we're talking about is one of the biz, biggest expressions of trust in God, that when we do that brings us peace, is how we use our finances and our resources. And as soon as we start talking about finances, I think a lot of people in the room are like, let's go back to the other three. Like, not, not that, I don't wanna talk about that. Because that is where so many of us place our security in planning out well, I gotta have enough for this and I gotta make sure, and with my investments and my retirement, I gotta make sure that all of this, right? And, and to be truthful, there is a level of peace that comes from this. If you have not enough and you're constantly struggling and then all of a sudden you have enough to, to make it ends meet, there's a breath of fresh air that comes from that. But if we're honest with ourselves, we idolize this to a place of deep security to where we, and this is why Jesus addressed this so much, is that this has become the deepest place of security for so many of us. So, so what are we saying here? It's that when our, when our goals align with God's, that's what, bring us, that's what brings us peace, right? That was the end of that quote that we read earlier. When our goals align with God's, so we convince ourselves that once I can have enough and we sort of are hoarding it up and we, we get very focused on our world and our security. And meanwhile, we have the king of the universe who has access to everything, infinite resources that we get so focused on this that we avoid doing anything else because that's uncomfortable starting to give towards anything else. But when you start to be obedient, I want you to hear me. When you start to be obedient with finances towards God, it unlocks a deep level of peace that you cannot experience until you do. This sounds like I'm trying to sell you something, especially for so, some of you who struggle with this, but this is so true. Okay, this is why Kingdom Builders, what we do here is beautiful because we have projects all over the world with people who are deeply suffering dying from just a lack of clean water, caught in human trafficking. There's all these different projects that we give to, to say, God, we want to make a difference where your heart is. So one of the really important steps for some of you this week in a soul inventory would be to say, God, I've been placing so much of my security in where my finances are at, in one way or another. And I want to place my security in you and I want to be obedient if there's a place that you are asking me to use my resources or my finances. That's a hard step, but this is one of those foundational practices that will supernaturally transform your soul. 
So, okay, here's what we're gonna do now. I wanna give us a minute here to do sort of a, a soul inventory together. And um, we'll take communion together as well as just sort of a, a practice of remembering what Jesus did. But before we do that, um, would you just join me wherever you're at? Just close your eyes and get alone with God. There's some of you in the room that as I'm talking, you have never committed your life to Jesus. You've been living for yourself. You're just on that wheel of life, the constant pressure. And you feel that tug of, I don't want to just live this way. I want to live my life for Jesus and be connected to him. Or there's some of you that you've been away for a while. You have, at one point you made that decision, but you've been living differently. And let me just tell you, Jesus deeply loves you and cares about you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And this is what we celebrate on Easter, that Jesus came down, he was God in flesh who came down and lived a perfect life because you and I couldn't. We've been rebellious and living in our own mistakes, but Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross to take our punishment so that you and I could be free and experience hope now and hope for the future. So if that's you, you know, you feel that tugging deep down and you know, I need to make this decision. I wanna ask you to get a little bold. All I'm gonna ask you to do is just to raise your hand in a second. And that's a really important step to not just say, well, well I thought it, like it was in my mind. No, if you're making this decision, it's a really important thing just to say, yeah, that's me today. And that's, that's, that's it. But I'm gonna count to three. And if you feel that tugging, I want you to be bold and say, yeah. So one, two, three, just slip it up and hold it up and say, I'm making that choice today to commit my life to Jesus. That's awesome. And just feel it stretch toward God for a minute as you hold up your hand to say, that's me, me this morning. That's awesome. Yeah, you can put your hands down. Okay, so now everybody together online in the room, let's all pray. Repeat after me. We're gonna pray a prayer of committal to God now. So repeat after me nice and loud. Say, dear Jesus, Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. Even at my worst, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. Even though I don't deserve it, I commit my life to you and I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for those that made that choice. We are so excited for you. I mean that so genuinely. If you made that decision, um, you know, internally to do that, what I wanna encourage you to do is on the connect card, there's a little slot where you can mark that off. So you could do one of two things. You can either drop that in the container or what I would really, really, really encourage you to do is on your way out, we have an area called the Welcome Center and we have a little booklet that'll help you take some next steps in your journey that we would love to give you. So please consider doing that. Um, and now let's stand up to our feet as we get ready to close. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sing a quick song together. And as we do this, we're gonna do a little soul inventory together where we say our resources, I'm sorry, our, our concerns, um, our thoughts, our desires, our resources, we put them all before God and we say, God, if I have been maybe avoiding this and, and, and not responding the right way, God, I want you to speak to me, right? And so listen, for the next two minutes, you got nowhere else to be. You got no one calling your name, no one, no little kids tugging on you, whatever, whatever life stage you're at. Take a minute here and let's come before God and sing this and then I'll come back and lead us in communion. God, I look to you and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you you're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do Give me 
that's a beautiful moment and song to anchor your soul with. Actually, what would probably be good for some of you is as you're taking time to respond this week with a, you know, in your soul inventory, this song is called God, I Look to You. So you can find it wherever. Maybe you just need to throw this on and just have a moment where you worship as you release some of these things. Um, but now what we'll do is we'll take a moment to remember what we anchor ourselves to. That's what communion is for, is uh, remembering what Jesus' sacrifice was for. So um, you can get ready to take the bread in just a minute. I'll direct you. Um, just wanna say though, there is no requirement. You don't have to be a member here to take communion. The only requirement is a desire to be in relationship and in right standing with Jesus Christ. That's it, okay? So um, if you don't, if you're not comfortable doing that, you, you can just kind of let this moment pass you by. You don't have to. Um, but now for the rest of us, let's take up the bread. You can hold it like this and um, let's pray together before we take this. Lord, we hold the bread in our hands, which we remember is a symbol of your body that was broken on the cross. That the nails that were driven through your hands and feet caused you intense physical pain. And so we take this moment to remember that you took our place and our punishment, even though we deserved to be on the cross, you took our place and give us freedom by your death and by your resurrection. So we say, thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread together. All right, now let's hold up the cup and let's pray. Lord, we remember that before you died, you set up this moment to remember your sacrifice, to remember the fact that when you died, your blood was spilled that you gave up your life. And we remember today that the blood of Jesus still has power to cover over every sin, over all our guilt, over all our shame. And it's a free gift. So we say, thank you for the blood of Jesus. I just feel like even there's people who have walked in today that are suffering under their own guilt and shame and sin. And I want to proclaim that the blood of Jesus that was spilled still has power to free you from whatever you're going through. So we say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's take the cup together. Awesome, okay, so here's what I wanna do now. Um, I'll get ready to dismiss you in just a second, but I wanna say, the band's gonna hang around for a minute and they'll sing this song again. And if you have a few minutes, again, I know we all are real busy. If you have a few minutes and you need to stick around and do a little bit more, because some stuff's coming up, this is a great thing to do. But why don't you just stretch forth your hand. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over you before we go. I just pray that this week, in every situation, you would sense the God of peace guiding your steps. That when you begin to feel anxiety and fear and pressure and, and these feelings welling up, that you would feel a desire to run to the anchor, to the King of Kings, who can sustain you through every situation. I pray for wisdom and for clarity in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen, amen. Feel free to hang around, but have a great weekend. Hey, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the last minute. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining us this weekend. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. And uh, so proud of my guy, Josh. What an incredible message. And I, I love the passage that he was teaching out of Philippians 4, 6. You know, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And I love the next verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Maybe that is something you could try this week. I don't, I don't know what your coping mechanism is with anxiety or any kind of stress in your life. Josh mentioned, you know, the phone, but maybe it's other things for you. What if this week you tried taking all of your anxiety, all of your concern, your stress, your worry to God? I, I, I dare you to do that. And I believe that the peace of God is gonna flood your heart and your mind this week. And uh, hey, if during that message, you made the decision, uh, as Josh was praying there at the end, to give your life to Jesus, we just wanna celebrate that with you. We believe that is the best, single best decision you could ever make with your life. And we want to resource you and walk this journey with you. If you would text 2023 decision to the number 97,000 or fill out a connect card on our website or app and let us know you made that decision. We want to be here for you. And also, if you just 
just want prayer today, you can text, please pray for me to the number 97,000, or you can fill out a connect card on our website or app as well. We would love to join with you in prayer and support you in that way. And the very last thing here is if you want to give before you sign off, you can do so on our app or website, or you can text any dollar amount to the number 84321. And uh, if you're this is one of your first times si signing on, please don't feel any pressure by this moment. We're just happy you're here. But thank you to those of you who regularly give. You know, you saw that Kingdom Builders video earlier of what our giving is going towards to help uh, replant Revival Church International in the north side of Pittsburgh, to help launch Kelly Brownlee and Story Collective Church, and even get our prison campus up and off the ground. And so, so many exciting things are happening that's all made possible because of your partnership with us in giving. And we just want to say we are so grateful. But hey, that's going to be it for us here. I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you this time next week. Thank you.